Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. I'm here in Porto, Portugal for the Basic Climate Science Conference that was just held at the University of Porto. No equations in this presentation, you'll be glad to know. I'm going to take you on a tour of the solar system and beyond. We're going to have a look around. I'm going to tell you about what lies behind that solar variation. We believe it's the motion of the solar system itself. And to help us understand that, we need to understand about uh, orbital resonance, because orbital resonance can accumulate forces and move large amounts of energy around the system, both from the sun out through the planets and back the other way as well. So it's a true system with feedbacks. Now, I'm going to start with a, a sort of simpler example rather than trying to do the whole system in one hit. So we're going to look at the moons of Jupiter. And what we see with Jupiter's moons is there's a relationship between the three of them that, that makes it so that you'll never see all three of them on the same side of Jupiter. You get a series of motion and they, they say in all the textbooks that it's because uh, there's a relationship between the orbital periods, 4 to 2 to 1, and they call this a Laplace resonance. And for several hundred years, they've said that this is how the resonance works. It's due to the orbital periods being in ratio. Uh, what myself and my colleague Stuart Graham discovered is they're wrong about that. It's not a 4 to 2 to 1 relationship. It's actually a 3 to 2 to 1 relationship, not between the orbital periods, but between the, the synodic conjunctions between the moon pairs. So you can see that if you look at the, in, the innermost fastest moving one, that's going to go around, it's going to meet the outer one three times in the same time as it takes the middle one and the outer one to meet twice and the inner one and the middle one three, three times, sorry, twice, sorry, twice for the inner, the inner two. And, um, so it gets, you get boggled by this. Now, there's something about this relationship that's very interesting because quite clearly there are forces going on between the planets as they go past it, between the moons as they go past each other close by. There's gravitational forces involved um, and that maintains a stable relationship. And this isn't really thoroughly understood by astronomy. And they said, well, you know, Jupiter's moons, it, it's the only example of this in the whole solar system. So they were saying it was something unique, you know, maybe it had happened by chance and it, it's something very rare. So Stuart and I decided to go having a look at the exoplanetary catalogue to see whether there were other systems elsewhere away from our solar system that also exhibited uh, these resonant relationships that, uh, that, that kept things in line. And we found an amazing one uh, in TRAPPIST-1, where we got not just one uh, three to two to one relationship, but two of them back to back. Uh, and in fact, the, the series goes one, one, two, three, six, nine. Well, obviously, three, six, and nine is, is also a three to two to one, uh, or nine, six, and three. Um, and it was only after we pointed out that it was these synodic relationships that the original scientists who'd done the investigation suddenly stopped talking about orbital periods and rushed a paper out saying, look at all these synodic pair relationships. Uh -huh. that, and they published that three months after we'd put it up on, on our weblog at Tall Blokes Talk Shop. So they're starting to, to take notice of what we're telling them, which is it, it's actually the synodic conjunctions of these planets or moons um, that then sets the orbits. So the, the strength of the resonance is due to the conjunctions and not just uh, a numerical relationship between orbital periods. So an another couple of three to two to ones, uh, Gliese 876, there's three there exhibiting the same thing, HR 8799, BCD, they exhibit the same thing. And in fact, other people have now gone through the catalogue, not, not with our synodic relationships, but just looking at orbital period relationships, and they now estimate 40% of exoplanetary systems contain pairs where, where you have relationships between these orbital periods. 
So we think that once they catch on to the idea that it's, it's actually between the conjunction periods that they should be looking, it's going to turn out there'll be a lot more than 40% of exoplanetary systems where we see resonance being exhibited. So coming back to our own solar system and looking at, at the really big planets, the ones that, that sort of... Uh, oh, sorry, we, coming back in our own solar system and, and taking a closer look at the moons now with this knowledge about it being the, the uh, conjunction, conjunctions that are important. I think astronomers had avoided thinking about conjunctions because it smacked of astrology, you know, so they avoided it for a couple of hundred years. They didn't want to be tainted with, with being accused of anything. So, um, but, but we find in, in the Pluto system, um, Styx, Nix and Hydra there in a a two, three, five. So we've got, you know, one, two, threes. We've got two, three, fives. These are all triplets in the Fibonacci series, by the way. Uh, and then we made the discovery that moons of Uranus, uh, Miranda, Ariel, and Umbriel, also exhibit a three to two to one. And that had never been spotted before because it's not obvious from just looking at the orbital periods that there's a relationship there. It's only once you do the calculation to get the conjunction periods that the 3 to 2 to 1 becomes obvious. So, in fact, this is ubiquitous and we can start to look more carefully at, at resonance in the solar system. Uh, Kepler, back in 1606, De Stella Novae, famous book, um, he, he knew that Jupiter and Saturn uh, had a kind of regular pattern to their motion that, that forms this kind of giant triangle in the sky over a period of 60 years. Uh, during that period you get two orbits of Saturn, um, five orbits of Jupiter and three conjunctions between the two of them. Uh, two, three, five. Again, Fibonacci numbers. And that giant triangle slowly precesses because it doesn't come back to exactly where it started after 60 years it, it keeps shifting around a little bit and over a period of around two and a half thousand years um, it'll get back to where it started again and that happens to be a similar periodicity to a, a solar variation um, that's also turning up in, in sort of paleoclimate records around two and a half thousand year wiggle called the Hallstatt cycle. So just bear that one in mind for a minute because we're going to come back and mention the Hallstatt again soon. Um, and there are other planetary conjunctions that happen every now and again that indicate that there's more of these kind of patterns going on. Here we're looking at, at Bond cycles and dansgaard ursha cycles uh, in the ice and in the Holocene uh, where every 1,470 years um, you get warming and cooling events. Uh, this has actually got the uh, warmer at the bottom, cooler at the top, because it's actually the, the depth of the cool uh, part of the cycle where you get the really close regularity of the 1,470 years between each deepest part of the cool, the cool part of the cycle. Um, the next one's due, the next cool point is due in 2150. Um, so it's quite likely we're going to be cooling down from here to there in general. <clears throat> and what we find is that in the year 680 on July the 9th, um, we got this line up of Jupiter, Neptune, Earth opposite Saturn. Uh, and on 28th of June 2150, we get virtually identical lineup: <coughs> Jupiter, Neptune, Earth, opposite Saturn. So this is another planetary cycle that we can relate to a, a climate cycle. Now, <coughs> Ivanka Chavatova, uh, back in the 80s, she, following on from the work of Paul D. Jose, who discovered a sort of one seven nine year return period for the for the motion of the major planets. It's not exact, but it's a cycle that's evident. Um, she found that, that for sort of 60 out of the 180 years, you got a nice regular motion of, of, uh, of, the, moon, of the sun around the bare center of the whole solar system. It sort of makes like a three-leaf clover shape. And then for the next 120 years, it gets more chaotic 
and then it goes back to being quite regular and what she called harmonious motion and so on. And you can see how these harmonious periods line up roughly with these orange triangles which are near maxima in, in uh, uh, temperature as indicated by the, or, or sorry, maxima in uh, solar activity as indicated by the, the 10 beryllium isotope proxy. And where you, where you have the uh, chaotic periods, this is where you get the cold grand solar minimum uh, sequentially. So there's the, the Maunder minimum that's been mentioned, the Dalton, the, the, uh, the cool part at around 1900, and we're just descending into another one now. So when we take the, the 179 year Jose cycle and the half period of the, of the uh, Halstatt cycle, uh, the side lobe harmonic of that actually gives us something called the De Vries cycle, which is 208 years, and that's very evident in, in that series of uh, grand solar minima, roughly 208 years apart. The, the 1900 one wasn't as obvious, so we, we don't count that one in, but we could be headed into a deeper one now. What we're seeing here is when we want to understand the effect of uh, solar heat on the oceans, we have to remember that the oceans have a massive heat capacity, and so this is similar to what Pavel Kalender's been telling you about the Earth's crust. Um, you integrate the solar data to get some idea of what's going on. So we integrated the solar data as a departure from its long-term average, compared it with Michael Mann's reconstruction of, uh, of millennial temperature change, uh, and we get a pretty good match, much better than he does with CO2, that's for sure. So it's not a bad correlation at all. And we wanted to extend this and, and have a look, well, what, what about over a longer period? So we took the entirety of the 10,000 year uh, beryllium 10 proxy record. Um, we integrated it, we filtered it with the 2,400 year cycle and this is what we came up with. And you can see the little ice age, very obvious, the modern warm period at this end. But going back, you know, we've got the medieval warm period there, a little drop where we went into the dark ages. The Roman warm period, a very cold era, known as the Hellstatt period the Minoan warm period, and so on, going back in time, right back to the Holocene optimum. Um, coupled with the Milankovitch cycles on obliquity, you know, we can be confident that the Holocene op optimum maximum temperature was actually higher up here, and there's been a gradual fall in temperature as the, as the obliquity cycle has changed over the last 10,000 years. So quite clearly, the, the motion of the planets and their relation to solar activity um, have quite a strong connection with the historical warm and cold epochs in, in Earth's climate. Uh, this this is, was a sort of model validation. This is, this is our solar model that was created by Rick Salvador back in 2013. Um, and this is how well it compares to uh, that 10,000 years, uh, sorry, 4,000 4, years we're showing here of the 10 beryllium uh, solar proxy data. <laughs> And this is the match our, our solar model gets to it. We made this prediction in 2013 in the uh, Pattern Recognition in Physics Special Edition, which the IPCC shut down two weeks after it was published because they didn't like our conclusions. So that was where we were up to in 2013. Uh, this was when the model was, was kind of uh, set up. And in the five years since, the data in green matches our model prediction pretty well so far. You know, it's, it's not a fantastic validation, it's only five years more data. But we'll see what happens over the next couple of decades and see whether all the other methods that are saying that we're going to see a big cool down, you know, around, around 2030, um, we'll see whether they're right, and, because we certainly agree with it. So there are several models now saying that this is what we're likely going to see. Uh, I made a, another wiggle matching model, a very simple empir empirical model using a, a solar integration of, of the yellow curve um, along with our prediction for, for the next uh, 40 years. Um, there's the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation there in green and then I just kind of copied an earlier chunk of it onto the end just for a bit of realism. Uh, we've got the Southern Oscillation Index in there as well. And we've even got carbon dioxide in there. 
at roughly around a uh, 0.4 centigrade per doubling, or, or if you don't want to entertain the idea of carbon dioxide having any effect at all, you could probably imagine that it's somewhere near the magnitude of the adjustments that have been made to the data. So the, the match we got when we put all that together, the, the, the match that I got to the uh, Hadley SST um, isn't bad. And similar to Pavel's prediction, um, without major volcanoes, we're looking like a drop of 0.25, 0.3 centigrade, perhaps, by the middle of this century. Thank you, uh, Tom. Um, so, again, it's just wiggle matching. I'm not making any great claims for this model. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert statistician. Um, I'm just an engineer who does sort of back of the fag packet calculations on spreadsheets and uh, just so take, take this as, uh, as a bit of entertainment rather than anything else, but um, we'll see how it pans out. <coughs> so I would like to leave a couple of minutes for questions because I'm sure people would like to know more about orbital resonance, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you.